Central Europe, Northern Lower Saxony. Work in a heather skep apiary during the cast swarming period. Early in the summer, the beekeepers allow their stocks to swarm in order to increase their skep colonies. The prime swarming period of the heather bees is followed in June by the period in which second swarms, or casts, are thrown off. The beekeepers of Klindvort's large-scale bee farm are expecting the casts at the Marshhorst outstand. On account of its enclosed arrangement and location in a birch, alder and pine wood, this position is particularly suitable for the work occurring at this period. Once the prime swarm has flown, seven days after their cells have been capped over in each skep, the young queens are ready to emerge. During this time, the bees are gathering nectar and pollen to supply the colony. The bees are now restless and run back and forth in the bee ways. Some individuals are occupied in uncapping the cells containing the fully developed queens. Immediately on emerging, the young queen surrounds herself with bees in order to leave the skep. The first cast is thrown off about seven to ten days after the prime swarm, headed by the old queen, has migrated. In contrast to the prime swarms, which are caught at the skep entrance in special swarm catching bags, the beekeeper allows the casts to escape. Year after year, they collect on particular trees. One of their favorite swarming places is a group of pine trees. Under their branches, several of the casts, each weighing one to one and a half pounds, collect together. They collect to form a swarm cluster of increasing size. The queens of the various different casts find their way to the outside. Now is the time for the beekeeper to act. With a jolt, he shakes the swarm clusters into a catching skep. While the skep is resting on the ground, the bees again congregate around the queens inside it, consolidating once more into a cluster. On the branches, swarming bees soon form a new cluster again. The beekeeper collects the casts at regular intervals. Two or three times he shakes swarms into the same catching skep. In the course of the swarming day, the casts increasingly tend to collect directly at the stand or in the immediate vicinity. By means of a skep placed on the eaves, the beekeeper offers the swarm a dark hollow, which invites them to enter. All day long, for several weeks on end, the master beekeeper, Georg Klindvort Jr., never stops dealing with the casts. Swarm clusters should never be left on their own for too long, otherwise they will fly off to permanent quarters. Collecting skeps are smaller, lighter straw vessels without plastering. The entrance is stuffed up. The virgin queens emerge in the colony at intervals of about two days. Warm weather encourages them to swarm. If, however, bad weather delays their swarming, a particular noise known as tooting is a sure sign that further queens are ready to emerge.
If a cast is thrown off now, the swarm follows the queen out of the skep entrance in a regular cascade. As more and more swarms are thrown off and collect under the branches and the eaves, the beekeeper assembles the filled catching skeps in order to provide for the casts. In a part of the Marshhorst quadrangle away from the swarming activities, the beekeeper has assembled empty skeps which were previously provided with strips of foundation comb and wooden spirals. He fills each skep with about two wooden platters full of cast bees. They usually contain several virgin queens. Only one of these will remain alive. She and the bees will form a new stock. To prevent the bees dispersing again, the skeps are immediately sealed bee tight with covering cloths. The entrances are still stuffed from the plastering of the basket work. Second swarm bees are also filled into skeps containing old comb without honey or brood. One and a half pounds is the usual starting weight of a new colony. To ensure good air circulation and temperature equalization, the apiarist first lays the skeps on their sides on the shelf. Young queens are also removed individually from the catching skeps. Together with a small number of workers, they are transferred to specially made wooden nucleus boxes named Klindvorters after their designer so that they can form small temporary colonies. As soon as the beekeeper has supplied each box with a ladle full of bees, he starts to search for the queens among the throng. One by one he places young queens among the bees. The idea is to obtain mated queens to hold in reserve. During the three week cast swarming period, about 200 boxes are filled in this way at Klindvort's bee farm. Bee candy placed on the floor of the box provides the bees with nourishment to start with because the flight openings remain closed for the first few days. The casts transferred to skeps have meanwhile settled down quietly. About 24 hours later, towards evening, the beekeeper places the skeps upright. As there is now no danger of the bees departing again, he opens up the entrances that have been stuffed with cow dung.
The bees now set about enlarging the entrance of their skep by gnawing it and smoothing it all around with propolis. The sealed nucleus boxes are set up in the open three days after they have been filled. When the larger of the two escape openings has been unstopped, the young queen can fly off on her mating flight. The spacing between the boxes makes it easier for the bees and their queen to find their way back to their own place. At this time, a number of tasks for the skeppist overlap. At the more distant outstands, like this one at Sassenholz, the recently restocked cast skeps have to be cared for. They were taken out during the evening hours. The obstructed entrances were opened immediately. Now, the following evening, the covering cloths are removed. On this occasion, the beekeeper places a dish of sugar syrup under each of the skeps. A splash of syrup inside the skep aims to lure the bees down to the food supply. After standing undisturbed in the open for a few days, the boxes are inspected for queen rightness. Well built up combs, brood cells filled with eggs and the first honey indicate to the beekeeper that he can rely on a mated queen here. He then closes up the flight opening. The second nursery colony is also queen right and therefore augments the reserve of usable queens. The two small combs, consisting only of drone cells, and the eggs in several of the large cells, tell the apiarist that the queen in this nuclear colony has remained unmated. So she has laid only infertile drone eggs. On average, he finds positive results in three quarters of all the boxes. If a box has been deserted by the bees, he concludes that the young queen has gone astray. As work continues, the beekeeper allows two to three casts to swarm out of each skep in the Marshhorst outstand until 10 to 12 days after the prime swarm, he takes action. To prevent further casts being thrown off and thus depopulating the stock, he now removes all the remaining queen cells. The stock is said to have been superseded. Queen cells, still containing virgin queens, are laid aside for the time being. Furthermore, he cuts the comb edges off about 15 to 20 centimeters from the opening of the skep. In this way, the bees receive more space to build up new combs, which they can fill with honey. He uses a special skep knife to do so. To ensure that a superseded stock has a queen, he finally opens one of the queen cells he has removed and allows a virgin queen to rejoin the colony. He makes sure that she is perfectly developed. By covering them with cloths, 
the superseded skeps are prepared for transport to more distant outstands. Skep by skep, the beekeeper works through all the 700 colonies of his apiary. In this way, he gives them the best possible start for heather honey gathering from these skeps. The sections of comb removed are collected for wax pressing at a later date. Just like the casts shaken into skeps, the superseded stocks also need repose and the proximity of good foraging grounds for favourable development. Their young queens make their nuptial flight at this time. It may happen that a queen fails to return to the skep and the colony becomes queenless. In this case, the heather apiarist can have recourse to the mated queen in one of the Klindwater nucleus boxes. Such queens are put into small nursery cages the opening of which is sealed with bee candy. These so-called queen cell cages are made by the beekeeper himself out of willow wood. They are provided with four longish slits and a spur for anchoring them. The beekeeper takes a number of filled nursery cages along with him when he inspects the superseded colonies on the outstands. If he is uncertain whether a stock is queen right, he cuts a wedge-shaped piece out of a comb in the middle as far as the brood nest. He inspects it thoroughly to see whether the queen has laid eggs in the cells. If he is unable to detect any eggs, he must assume that the queen remained unfertilized or has been lost. A stock in this condition is provided with a new queen by fixing a queen cell cage inside the skep. The bees of the colony get into contact with the queen via the slits and, if she finds acceptance, they eat their way through to her and gradually release her. The skep is provided with a sticker. In this way, all the superseded stocks are controlled by the beekeeper. This test proves positive. On average, one skep in ten has to be provided with a caged queen.
In front of the accustomed standing ground, returning foragers are already waiting to carry their supplies through the entrance. Since the middle of the swarming period, a number of plants are in nectar flow around the outstands. They help to bridge the gap until the heather migration starts in August. In the vicinity of the outstands, the bramble blossom attracts the bees in the wood. In the bushes alongside the paths, it is mainly the buckthorn alder. But honeysuckle is also a favourite here. Out on the pastures and field margins, thistles and white clover are particularly important. In former days, buckwheat crops provided the main source of forage for the heather bees at this time of year, and additional feeding of the late casts was unnecessary. In fields and at the wayside, the bees now prefer cornflowers, as well as, in particular, chamomile as a source of nectar and pollen. When the foragers return with this load, they are able to communicate information about the source of nourishment as soon as they reach the skep entrance. A further source of food is found on leaves, particularly in oak woods, the bees collect the sticky exudation caused by aphids, known as honeydew. The bee farm's colonies are distributed over six permanent outstands located along the margins of the cultivated land. About 30 cast colonies occupy the stand near the Alpershäuser Moor. The loose arrangement of sites makes it easier for the bees to find their way home. Here the beekeeper is checking their progress. Within two weeks this colony has built new comb in the empty skep down to the first pair of spiles. Skeps where the combs are built right from the start prove to be very productive of comb honey. Here, seven of the nine combs produced in a Lüneburg type skep have already been built. If necessary, the apiarist will straighten irregularly built combs. Cells damaged in the process are soon replaced by the bees. He carefully adjusts the bee space between the combs too. Some stocks have already built their combs down to the centre pair of spiles and laid out all nine combs. If the skeppist discovers a queenless colony while inspecting the comb development, he shakes the rest of the bees out of the skep. Beforehand, he makes perfectly sure that no queen is present. The evicted bees will beg their way into other colonies. The skeps remain on the outstands for several weeks. Up to the time of migration to the heather, the bees are engaged in building out the combs, rearing the brood and laying up the necessary stores. With the help of casts, the beekeeper has succeeded in increasing his stocks threefold.